Good day everyone, my name is Kupad and welcome to episode 0 of Civ 5 Civilization Challenge as Alexander the Great of Greece. Now this whole episode 0 thing, just like last time with Ahmad al who uh, I did mention at the end of the playthrough uh, of Morocco, I will be uh, playing Morocco again, probably after I complete all these other few, I think it was, what was it, 52 civs? <laughs> I'm like, complete the other 51 civs, I'll be going back to Morocco again and doing a, another playthrough of it at a higher difficulty, because I do think it's, it's quite a powerful uh, civ and one I quite like as well, kind of fits in well with my play style, um, and I'd like to revisit it at a you know, higher difficulty than King. Um, but this whole episode's zero thing is basically just to uh, discuss the you know, plan going into the game. You know, not necessarily, of course, how things will work out depending on the situation we end up in you know, with the map and just the roles we get, essentially. You know, what happens when we actually get into the game. Um, but to get, basically kind of figure out you know what the best thing to do, which with you know the save that we are playing will likely end up being I try to try and plan out some sort of strategy you know at least for the early game on you know what we want to do and you know kind of and what we'd want to try to aim for you know, in terms of victory good condition although it could end up changing like going almond almond going for a diplomatic victory and still you know getting ready to win a diplomatic victory but instead winning a cultural victory before we get there <laughs> um yep yeah was kind of surprised that we get, was able to pull that off. Um, but, you know, we basically want basically... Ah, I'm saying basically too much, basically. So, uh, we want to try and basically... There I go again. Want to create a roadmap, quit saying basically, of, the, or of our plans for the game. Now, with Greece, the Civ power, or the power for the Civ, is as follows. City-state influence degrades at half the normal rate and recovers at twice the normal rate. This makes it really good for holding down an ally, a city-state ally, as it takes a long time for city-states to, you know, basically for, for you to lose your influence with them and therefore you hold on to them as an ally for far far longer than you normally would and it makes it harder for other cities other civs i should say to bump you off of city-state influence you bump you off of being the ally and with the fact that it recovers at twice the normal rate you can actually bully uh, city-states uh, more and not suffer quite as much from it. You still suffer from it, you know, in terms of your um, influence with city states. You will go down if you bully them, and of course, if you take one over, you'll get a pretty big penalty with other city states. Um, so you don't really want to be doing too much of it. And I, in fact, never do it. I have never bullied a city state in my entire time of playing Civ Five. I have taken over a city state or two, you know, occasionally. And of course, I haven't played any of the civs that, you know, have powers that work well with that. Like, what is it, Genghis Khan? No, it's not Genghis Khan. It was the other guy. Oh, what was he named? I'm blanking on the name. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Attila the Hun. Um, I thought. Maybe it wasn't Attila. Maybe it's just because Attila you know, tends to take over city-states that I thought they had a special thing with them. I, I remember someone having it. I was a tell of the Hun. Maybe it was Genghis Khan. Maybe at one point Genghis, you know, one of these two had something to do with city states, but I, I think their power might have changed. Oh no! I, uh, yeah, right here. I'm just you no, know, not seeing it. Plus thirty percent combat strength in fighting city state units or attacking city state itself. So makes them really good against city states. So they tend to take over city states a lot, and it's good for you know, that sort of playthrough. But for the most part, it's generally a bad idea. So. The recovering at twice the normal rate, not really going to mean much, you know, unless I decide to capture a worker, maybe capture a city-state, you know, if I need to. I generally don't 
do that unless you know I just need a resource that they have and I can't get an allyship, which you know, we should be able to do anyways. Well, I just really, really want the spot for myself, you know, that sort of thing. But I hardly ever do it. Occasionally, I might steal a worker from a city state early in the game, but I tend not to do that too often either. Um, though that is you know, a better possibility for you know, Greece. And obviously, you know, diplomatically, they are great, so we'll probably be going again for a diplomatic victory. Who knows, we might be able to pull a cultural victory off again. <laughs> um, actually, not as quite as likely. Um, but it is always possible if we get a really good spot like we did last time. Um, but yeah, they're good for getting hold of city-states, keeping them, uh, you know, using their resources, you know, using them to boost yourself. And you can, of course, do a bit more in terms of bullying them, but I tend not to just personal playstyle. Um, it's not a particularly powerful power, um, but it has some uses. The thing that really gets to me, though, is Greece's unique units. They are awful. <laughs> For me, at least. You know, some people may find this to be like, really good for doing like early game wars. Both their units are early game units. The Hoplite is Ancient Era. Companion Calvary is, I forget what's after, right after, I believe it's the Classical Era, right after Ancient. It's like one of the first classical texts. It's part of horseback riding. Um, so it's also your early game, not quite as early game as the Hoplites, but still, still pretty early game. Um, the Hoplites are not that good. You know, all they are is, you know, they are ancient era units, as I said, specialized in defeating mounting units. It's basically like a, you know, spearmen, an upgraded spearmen, and it's higher combat strength. That's it. It's a spearman with more combat strength. No special abilities, and the bonus supposed to mount the same things that the spearmen again. It's just that they're more powerful. Uh, replaces spearmen. You see, bonus was mounted exactly the same. Just instead of 11 combat strength, it has 13. Whoop de freaking do. It this to me is just plain bad unique unit because it doesn't have any abilities. When you upgrade from Spearman to the next level up, which I believe is Pikeman, it doesn't keep that extra two combat strength. No, it just goes back to vanilla combat strength for what if the Pikemen are. It's pointless, you know, unless you're going to do early game wars, which I am not one to really ever do. It doesn't really have much purpose, and these guys are more specialized. You know, they're meant to go against the mounting units, not like um, the warriors or the archers, which are you know good against anything. You know, spearmen, you know, are still good against, you know, are pretty good against you know, normal units, but uh, they're meant more to go against mounting units, and it's just to, to me, it's not very useful at all, especially since I don't like doing early game wars. I prefer to build up. You know, I want to you know, establish myself early game. The only way I would do a war early game is if there's a really, really good opportunity to do something with an early game war, which with the new patch, you know, is doing an early game war is better now because you get only a fraction of the I forget what it's called. It's, it's not like, I'm pretty sure it's not infamy. More monger points. There we go. More monger points. You, you only get a fraction, tiny fraction, of the warmonger points in ancient era. And, you, of course, it, the percentage of warmonger points that you get for doing, you know, like taking over cities and declaring war and all that, goes up each era to the normal uh, full amount of warmonger points. Once you get to modern, I think, is when you you get to... Uh, full war monger points, but like ancient era, it, it's not going to hurt you as much diplomatically, which is good. Um, so you know, it is a possibility that we might be able to do an early game war, but I'm not a fan of doing those unless there's just something really, really good, a city really, really good that I want to take, which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Most of the time, I just prefer to build up myself. Companion Cavalry suffers much the same thing because it's an early game unit. I tend not to do much with armies and wars early game. I prefer more. I prefer not to go to war till more towards mid game, and so 
again for me especially it's not as useful but at least unlike the hoplite the companion cavalry is useful outside of ancient era hoplite's only useful in ancient era not you doesn't do anything for you once you get up to pikemen just period does not do anything because pikemen are stronger and there you just no abilities that it keeps when it uh, you upgrade them companion cavalry however does have stuff uh, of course weak to spearmen Lenny Gray Greek Spin Blooded unit is faster, has higher combat strength, and helps produce great generals more quickly than the horsemen, which it replaces. So combat strength is, you know, again, it's something that's not gonna matter when it levels up. But and the movement as well as it looks like it's only gonna be on the companion cavalry, not when it gets upgraded unless the knight Yeah, it will actually lose unless I I am mistaken, it will lose a movement point when you upgrade it. And of course, the knight will have more combat strength. But it, I might be mistaken on that. You, it, maybe it will keep the movement points, but if I remember correctly, it will likely lose it. However, it does have a unique ability, which is Great Generals 1, which is what gives you know, it the ability to produce Great Generals more quickly. And that it just is combat likely to create Great Generals. So it allows you to rack up great generals um, faster, which is quite useful. So you, you get a good amount of these guys, and you can get some, you know, build one or two, like early game, you can get some early great generals, and it can help you uh, later on as well to get some more great generals when you, as it you know, starts to become harder and harder to get them, especially if you're doing a lot of war. And of course, great generals are always useful, not only to uh, up up the combat strength of your troops, but also to pump down a citadel or two if you need it. So this is something that is a little bit more useful. Um, and I do use, you know, I, I normally do like to have a couple of horsemen or two, you know, you know a couple of cavalry, basically, um, in the back, you know, mixed in with my army. Uh, so, you know, th that at least has some use for me. Hoplite doesn't, really. <laughs> which is unfortunate and the big thing for me is that you know with alexander the power to me says uh, go diplomatic victory now with militaristic civs you do get a boost to military as well Well, you get a boost with everything really when it comes to uh, city states because you can get food you can get culture which will help out your cultural policies and you can get military units and happiness. So the happiness in the military units you know, will help you with potential for domination victory as well. Of course, these guys are early game, so it doesn't help all that much later on when you're pushing for an actual victory. Although you great general saying like heading cavalry does help, oh, but it doesn't. Um, but uh, you, know, to me, this you know kind of screams diplomatic victory, even over conquest victory, um, and the conquest or domination, whatever, whichever one it's called, I believe it's actually domination, um, that isn't always the easiest <laughs> thing to pull off, and I'm not the best at it, although it can certainly do it, and as you go up and up in difficulty, which we are going to be moving up one notch in difficulty level this game, I was going to go up two to Immortal, but I don't want to do that with Alexander here, because it, to me, it just doesn't feel like a good sieve to try that on. What is the next sieve? Impronounceable guy from Assyria, which will be a good one to start doing Immortal on. Um, I like his power. I like the unique unit and building. So that one will probably uh, almost definitely go Immortal on. Um, but Alexander just doesn't feel like a good one to go quite that high, uh, quite yet. Um, and to me, it just seems like a fairly weak sieve, it just in my eyes, especially with the way I play. Um, gonna try to go diplomatic, m might have a chance of domination as well in there with, you know, all the military reunions that we're probably going to be getting, and the great generals, hopefully, that we'll be getting as well. And the happiness will help, and the policies could help. We kind of have to see, I guess, I suppose. Uh, it's a very open-ended sieve, you could do a lot of things with it. Um, but it's also fairly weak in what it gives you. It's mainly open-ended because it 
doesn't really push you in any one direction very hard. You know, it's like a little, it's, it's like a very gentle nudge forward instead of, you know, like some other sieves which, you know, give you uh, things that tend to be a little more specific or just really powerful. Like Casimir, free social policies. I cannot wait to play Casimir. <laughs> Been wanting to play Poland, but I've, haven't actually done it yet. Well, that's kind of the plan there. Um, yeah, diplomatic victory most likely, potentially domination. Kind of have to see just how things go for the most part. So now we'll set up our game. Uh, of course, Alexander the Greece. We're going to do uh, Pangea map using Pangea Plus here. Let's go over the advanced setup though. Is that Pangea Plus? I, that's really the one I'd want to use. Not, not going to use the vanilla one, just go with Pangea Plus. It's a little better. Standard size, so 8 players, 16 cities, 8. Uh, we were playing king last time, so we're going up to emperor this time. Again, I don't want to go up to immortal with Greece, just because I don't feel very comfortable doing it with this specific sieve. If this one was not the next one in line, it was like, uh, it, it was another sieve that I felt a little more comfortable with, I would have gone up to immortal this playthrough, but eh, let's stick with emperor for Greece. Uh, standard game pace, as always. I, I personally always play standard. I, I just prefer it over the other two. Epic takes a really long time, and quick is way too short. Well, I shouldn't say epic takes a really long time. It takes a, a while longer. Marathon takes a really freaking long time. But I prefer just standard. Of course, always start in ancient. Why would you ever start anywhere else? <laughs> Let's start in the very last era of the game, where everyone can win immediately. <laughs> that would be kind of silly. And everything would take forever to build, too. Because you don't have any infrastructure. Uh, world age, normal, 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 and standard resources. Uh, we'll have to see about strategic balance, potentially, you know, potentially going to strategic balance, I should say, at some point. For now, I'll keep it at standard. The reason why I'm saying I might have to go to strategic balance at some point is because uh, you can run into problems, of course, with not having resources that you really need anywhere near you. I was, and other cities may have everything <laughs> just just so happen to have everything located right next to their capital or something it's it's not a really balanced strategic balance is more balanced so that everyone gets a little bit of what they need near ish to where they spawn uh, so it's more balanced for everybody i'm going to keep it for standard for now but we'll kind of see because pangeas are a little more vulnerable to it than the archipelago is a little archipelago you can see, you know, with like the oil and the coal, and well, even the uranium, I had problems finding any of it anywhere and being able to get any of it. I think almost all the oil was in city states. The coal was in not very good locations to um, settle. There's a handful of them, and uranium. There really wasn't much uranium on that map from what I remember. <laughs> like hardly any really. I think it was all in like one area for the most part. But we're going to keep it standard for now. Uh, victory types, normal. Yeah, everything but time. That's the way I always play. And we, I have turned off complete kills. I did a test recording prior, so this is, all the settings are saved this time. Um. You have turned, of course, complete kills off because, as we saw last time, that kind of screws up the cultural game. So, as much as I like it for domination games, and even to, to an extent diplomatic, um, it screws up cultural games too much. So, I am going to turn it back off and everything I'll you know, keep as it was last time. So, yeah, that's everything set up. This is how we are, this is how the map is going to be well set up <laughs> so i am going to start the game let the world load and i will see you guys in the next episode where we will actually start playing so that'll be it for this and i will see you then